President. Senator Rambin. Madam President, I thank you again. Madam President, I just want to put on the hands uh, just to end off the point that I left on, which is that by virtue of Section 79, 1 of the Constitution, I would like to just place on record the foundation for the proposition that I made, which is that there is a way to do things. It must be, it must be done in accordance with the law, and the Supreme Law says the President, acting in accordance with the advice of the Prime Minister, may by directions in writing assign to the Prime Minister to the Prime Minister or any other minister responsibility for the business of government of Trinidad and Tobago, including the administration of any department of government. And that, Madam President, is the foundation for which one says that there is line responsibility for different aspects of governance. And what we have seen demonstrated in this particular case is that the Minister of Finance and I want to be very careful of how I use the words, Madam President, but the Minister of Finance has taken over control single-handedly of this entire process. The one person from beginning to end, and even here today to answer the motion, that has been in general, to use the words of the Constitution again, general direction and control of the entire Galleon's passage has been the Minister of Finance. And one, one really has to ask, and. When you listen to the population, Madam President, something that is unfamiliar to this government, when you listen to the population, what the population is asking is, what is the motive behind the idea of the Minister of Finance or the actions of the Minister of Finance taking control of this process? Why? And going back to the motion and the first recital, Madam President, on the issue of the procurement, it is very important, Madam President, because when I expect the government will tell us that this is all done under the power of cabinet. Well, let me deal with that, Madam President, and say that it is not the role of cabinet to exercise procurement functions in a society that has respect for the rule of law. And, you know, we've become very familiar, Madam President, because there have really been, in the two years and nine months that this government has been in power, there have really been only two ministers who have done any piloting of any legislation. It's been the Attorney General and the Minister of Finance. And we understand when the Minister of Finance is on solid ground, an intelligent, perhaps the most intelligent uh, member of the government. Minister. We, so, Minister. Senator, Senator Don't go down that line, please. You've made your point about the ministers who have piloted bills. Leave it at that, please. Well. Let me, uh, as you please, Madam President. But <laughs> Madam President, one understands when the minister is on good ground, we know that he makes an issue of providing us with all of the material. And he demonstrates how he's on good ground on an issue. But I was very surprised today, Madam President, in answering this particular motion. It was all fanfare and noise. And, 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 portray, and my, my, my brother, that is not the way. If you have facts, bring the facts. The population will judge you on the facts that you present, whether they are credible or not. But when you listen to the reply of the Minister of Finance today, it was respectfully, Madam President, just noise and, 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 and drama, as though the theatrics is going to answer the facts. It doesn't work like that. We, we were still, we are still waiting on the substance of what transpired in this particular case. We are still waiting for the Minister of Finance to just stand up. And the Minister of Finance could have answered Senator Mark's motion today, Madam President, like I said before, in perhaps one minute, and say the government is prepared today to act in the public interest and disclose all of the material in relation to this Galleon's passage. The government stands for transparency and accountability. And in spending the money that belongs to the people of Trinidad and Tobago in the public interest, the government of Trinidad and Tobago is prepared to disclose 
from beginning to end, from the committee to the, to the purchase, all of the documents that justify that there was transparency, accountability, and most importantly, that the people of Trinidad and Tobago got value for money in this transaction. And that is what we were waiting for. That is what would have put an end to the motion. We could have wrapped up in, in no time. But the government did not surprise us today, Madam President. Because after all of the theatrics and all of the, the, all of the replies and everything that the Minister of Finance said, the people of Trinidad and Tobago are no wiser as to what happened to the 17.5 million US dollars that continues. And you know, what is, imp what is important, Madam President, is that it starts off at 17.5 million, but it continues to grow as the days go on. It has risen by another 350,000 US to put on this canopy, and I don't know if it's tapolin or what they're going to put on top of it for the people to go under. I don't know. But what we do know for sure is that the people of Trinidad and Tobago are yet to even be told what their money was spent on. And the, and the money continues to be spent. And Madam President, today was the first time that I have ever heard in the explanation of the Minister of Finance that there was a valuation report. This is what the Minister of Finance said. There was a valuation report that was prepared by the people who are connected to this vessel called the Galleon's Passage. They said they didn't re rely on that. They went and got an independent valuation report. Well, Madam President, let the people of Trinidad and Tobago judge the credibility of this explanation by what was said by the Minister of Finance. The people who have a connection to the vessel, so that is why the Minister of Finance said, we didn't act. Hands up in the air. We didn't act on that. We disregarded that. But the, and the reason why they disregarded it, Madam President, because there's a clear conflict in you owning the vessel and procuring a valuation of the vessel that you own by a company that is connected. So that company says the value of the vessel, their own vessel, to use my words, own in inverted commas, 19 million. They value their own vessel at 19 million. Lo and behold, the government of Trinidad and Tobago goes to an international, reputable, 400 vessels this, 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 this company is in charge of around the world. Well, I don't know, Madam President. All of a sudden, the value of the vessel jumps from 17, sorry, from 19 million US by the owners to almost 40 million. So you know what I want to advise the government to do? Take that vessel and sell it. <laughs> Take that vessel that the international Chinese who are in charge of 400 vessels around the world, well, you all got a great deal for the people of Trinidad and Tobago according to the Minister of Finance. So why not act in the best interest? Let's sell that vessel and buy two galleons passage. Because according to the Minister of Finance, the value of the vessel that they have bought is twice the value of what the owners themselves tell you is valued. Such a good deal by the committee. Let's sell the Galleon's Passage when it arrives in Trinidad and let's buy two more vessels. We have 40 million worth in vessels. Why not? It makes, absolute, it makes absolute sense to me because the government has gotten such a good deal. But I want to dare the government to try and sell the Galleon's Passage just like how, just like how, Madam President. We bought the MV Sue, and when we tried to sell it, it still parked up. We could still go and see the MV Sue. It still parked up down in Chagramas. You see, Madam President, with the greatest respect, when we do things, we must try and do things with some kind of order. I made the point that a committee, a cabinet subcommittee, a, a subcommittee of the cabinet was set up 
That included the Minister of Finance again, the Honorable Minister of Public Utilities, the then Minister of Tourism, and the Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister. Apart from the, as I know, and it is public knowledge that the Minister of Finance has his own vessel, but apart from that, I don't see that there is any qualification in any of these ministers to do anything with purchasing of a vessel. So you, it's like you're buying cat in bag. This is the value that the government places. This is the value. This represents the value that the government places on the money that, that belongs to the taxpayers of this country. You take 17.5 million US dollars and place it in the hands, place the power to spend that in the hands of a committee that has absolutely no qualification to purchase a marine vessel. And that is perhaps why, Madam President, that is perhaps why we keep saying that we find ourselves in the position that we find ourselves in today. That is why a motion has to be brought and questions have to be asked and documents still cannot be provided to the people of Trinidad and Tobago with respect to this matter. So, Madam President, back to the legality of what was done. Any subcommittee of cabinet absent technical input, which I just demonstrated, Madam President, or members vested with technical capacity can manipulate specifications and requirements of any item to be procured so as to achieve the desired result and so distort the basic tenets of procurement. That is transparency, accountability, integrity, value for money, and equality, and equality of treatment. And that is the risk that you run, Madam President. If you have a group of persons who have been given by the cabinet of the country the power to procure X, but they have no qualification in the quality of what you are asked to procure, what do you expect to get as a result of that process? And what is even more alarming about this entire procurement process is that the cabinet has appeared to have usurped the independent function of the board of the Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. And wrongfully, respectfully, Madam President, wrongfully arrogated onto itself procurement functions, and so substitute itself as the decision maker for the Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam President, the Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago is set up under statute, you know. There are statutory functions that the parliament of this country has delegated to the Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago, one of which is to do exactly what the subcommittee of the cabinet was set up. So you arrogate unto yourselves powers that under statute belong to another body lawfully. This, Madam President, in my respectful opinion, represents an incursion or transgression into the independence and autonomy of the board of the Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago and may well amount, Madam President, and may well amount, Madam President, to an unlawful and un ultra-virus exercise of power. What it, and and I've, I've made this point, Madam President, it is even more alarming that the line minister has no input in this process. Madam President, it is an abuse, or let me put it a different way, it is a breach of both the Constitution, the Exchequer Act, and the Port Authority Act for the cabinet to arrogate onto itself the power to place selected members of its own to perform a procurement function. And you know, Madam President, what is, what is shocking, let me put it in those terms, what is shocking about this is that this comes on the heels of both like I said before, every single member of the parliament agreeing that the purpose behind the procurement legislation is to prevent exactly what the government has sought to do in the face of that. That your own, you can handpick people to procure. Senator Ramdeen, uh, 
I'm very sorry to have to interrupt you at this stage, but you are and have been speaking on one point practically since you have started, and I think now you need to move on to another okay. point. I'm, I'm guided. Madam President, I want the people of Trinidad and Tobago to understand what they have spent, or let me put it a different way, what their 17.5 million US dollars has been spent on. And I want to refer to the report that was done by the US Department of Homeland Security on this particular vessel that was done on the 6th of April, 2018. Senator Mark touched on two aspects of it, and I'm not going there. So I'm going to a different aspect of the report. Madam President, before this particular vessel was procured by the government during that period of time when we could not find a passenger vessel for the entire island journey, we had a fiasco, if you want to put it kindly, with respect to the ocean floor. And a report similar to this one was put into the public domain about that vessel and the problems that arose that eventually caused that vessel to, be, to not be considered by the government anymore. So, Madam President, this is a report that was procured by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, I said on the 6th of April, 2018. The vessel that the Minister of Finance um, spoke about with respect to when you put the hull and when you put the substructure, and this was virtually, his entire submission was, this was a new vessel that was procured by the government. Well, let's test that, not by anyone else, but the Department of Homeland Security, who I don't think has any interest in this matter. Madam President, at paragraph, at second page of this report, this new vessel that was purchased by the government has a page of deficiencies that have been pointed out by the Department of Homeland Security. And I would expect, Madam President, that the persons who are preparing this report for the United States Coast Guard will know a little bit about these vessels. So I think we could rely on what they've said. Under description of the deficiencies, Madam President, let the people of Trinidad and Tobago know that the vessel that they, are that they have purchased for 17.5 million US. The number four main- are you, are you quoting now from yes. the document or are you saying this and then going to No, 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 I'm quoting from the document okay. and I'm sorry that I didn't say that, Madam Correct. President. At page three of the document, I quote under deficiencies. A, the new vessel, I'm quoting, A, number four engine, was, is inoperable. The number four engine is inoperable due to a lube oil leak in the reduction gearbox. Well, Madam President, the last vessel that we bought, the, the engine couldn't start. The new vessel, according to the Minister of Finance that we've bought, has a, the number four engine is inoperable due to a lube oil leak in the reduction gearbox. The vessel is carrying 25,000 liters of diesel in open containers on the main deck. I expect the reason for that and the explanation that we will be given is that that is because of the long journey that is taken from China. The vessel doesn't have any nozzles to fit the emergency fire hoses. So if something were to happen on this vessel, you will see on the Galleon's Passage, what you see normally when a fire takes place in Trinidad, a number of people with a hose, mm -hmm. with no nozzle, and it water gushing here, there, and everywhere. That's the 17.5 million US that we spent that belongs to all of us, the people of Trinidad and Tobago. There are two pages of deficiencies in this report that is done by the Department of Homeland Security. What the report ends up with, Madam President, is that at the time that the vessel was preparing to leave, because we have a timeline that keeps moving and shifting as we go along, the, lube, the, the leak in the, in, in the gearbox has not been fixed in the number four engine as yet. And that is up to the time, that is 4th of April, 2017. So 
Madam President, the idea that the Minister of Finance is giving to the country that this is a new vessel, that the people of Trinidad and Tobago are going to get some kind of gift when, when, when it arrives here. As we speak today, and I will go now, Madam President, to the timeline. Madam President, I want to tell the government that they should have a little more respect for the intelligence of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> Madam President, when you pick up, when you just simply Google the Galleon's passage, and you see, look, Madam President, it is countless. Almost every month, the people of Trinidad and Tobago have received a broken promise and been given another promise by the government as to when the arrival time is going to be. It's, it, and, and it starts, Madam President, just, to, just to, 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 to bring you up to date. January 19th, new ferry to arrive in April. An article by Shaliza Hassan Ali, Friday, January 19, 2018. The U.S. 17.4 million, I'm quoting Madam President, I saw, I'm sorry. The U.S. 17.4 million catamaran to service the inter-island sea bridge is now expected to arrive on our shores from China by the middle of April. And two paragraphs down. And it would also cost taxpayers an additional 800,000 U.S. in associated fees, moving the total bill so far to 18.2 million, 127.4, sorry, 18.2 million US, 127.4 million TT. This was in January, Madam President. In January, we were told it was coming in April. In April, we were told it was coming in June. In June, we are now to, being told it's coming in July. I mean, Madam President, you know, the Minister of Works and Transport has told us time and time again, well, there's no big thing. The, 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 sea, the sea bridge is operating well with the Cabo Star, and everything is fine. The, it, it's, it's going empty at times. Well, you know, it is the government of Trinidad and Tobago that has spent 17 point, well, no, 18.2 million U.S. dollars on this vessel. And, Madam President, at the end of the day, all that the people of Trinidad and Tobago are asking for is for us to understand that we got value for money. All that we are asking for is for the government to be transparent in what they have done in this particular transaction. If it is that the government has been above board in what they have done... Thank you, Madam President. If the government has been above board in what they have done, then there would be absolutely no reason for us to be standing here for hours debating a motion that simply asks the government to make disclosure of what they have done. This is public business, Madam President. This is the interest of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. It is the money, it is the money that belongs to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, $127.4 million that has been spent in procuring this vessel. And while that has been spent, and while the price tag keeps going up day by day, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, as yet, have not been able to get the benefit of a journey between Port of Spain and Scarborough on the Galleons Passage. And as we speak today, we still can't tell any citizen, as the Minister of Finance was unable to do in replying today, to tell us when are the people of Trinidad and Tobago going to have the comfort of sitting on the Galleons Passage and going from Scarborough to Tobago, so from, from, from Port of Spain to Scarborough, and from Scarborough to Port of Spain. We are still unable. As we stand here, we are still unable to tell the country how much more it is going to cost. Because you know, Madam President, in addition to what Senator Mark has asked for in this particular motion, there is a hidden aspect to this, which the government should also disclose. That vessel called the Galleon's Passage cannot travel from Honolulu to Port of Spain without insurance. So who has been given the contract to insure the Galleon's Passage from the trip, the journey it is making, the passage that is going to travel between Honolulu and Trinidad? 
We are yet to be told how much it is going to cost when it reaches Port of Spain and it has to be docked somewhere for the repairs, the tarpaulin to be put on, to be traveled, the seats and all that has to be done. We are yet to be told that. This is a government, Madam President, that has promised transparency and accountability and it is about time that they, they deliver on that promise to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And I want to end, Madam President, with a very familiar quote that I have repeated more than once in this parliament and it's very apt to what Senator Mark has asked for today in this parliament. And I want to end on this note and the government should take note of it. It is maybe worth reminding ourselves that whereas freedom, transparency, and accountability are the hallmarks of a participatory democracy, secrecy, lies at the heart of every dictatorship. I thank you, Madam President. Leader of government business. <clears throat> thank you very much, Madam President. Madam President, it was not my intention to speak on this debate. As leader of government business, I had intended to have the Minister of Finance respond and just the Minister of Works as our second speaker. <coughs> but because the motion fell flat and there wasn't much to be said by the opposition, and the dependents being smarter than the opposition, I hope I have said something that is not offensive, realize that they do not see certain merits in this motion and felt they, they should not be speaking on it. Madam President, this motion did in fact fall flat. Because, <clears throat> let me start by quoting former Prime Minister Manning. He used to say, he, he had a saying, he used to say, nothing wrong in having your propaganda. But when you start to believe your own propaganda, watch it. <laughs> that is what is happening on the opposition bench. It was amply said by the Minister of Finance. You're starting to believe the fake news. And fake news is now coming an international dilemma. <clears throat> because you create new fake news on social media, and then you're getting people to start to believe it. And it, 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 it is like virtual reality. It, it does not exist in the real world. But it exists in the figments of people's imagination. The other point I want to start with, Madam President, <coughs> is it is the position of this opposition to stymie, to block, and to put up roadblocks on everything that this government attempts to do. The Prime Minister said it amply in the, Senate, in the House yesterday during the debate, you know. Where they cannot come to the Parliament and stop something, they go to the court. They're not going to the people, you know. They're going to the court. The classic example of that is the highway from Kumoto to San Diego and the, It is the only highway project in this country at all approvals, up to the regional corporation's approval, was achieved. And yet, they found a way to have their supporters and people who are sympathetic to their cause go to the courts to the court it is now tied up with the Privy council and we have lost a whole dry season in in dealing and servicing the people of northeast trinidad they did the same thing with property tax it's only two or three weeks ago that the property tax saw its way into the out, out of the senate and it has gone back for amendments in the house so that now we could start the valuation process to reach the threshold of 50% so that we could implement the, the property tax, hopefully later down this year. <clears throat> they want to campaign in 2020 and say, what has the government done? They have done nothing. And they're only saying this, and they're only saying that, and they're only saying the other. But Madam President, through you, 
that strategy will no longer work. We are going to proceed with our developmental agenda in Trinidad and Tobago. Madam President, let me deal with the first part of the motion. Whereas the government has acquired the Guardian Passage, a new inter-island island passenger ferry in a procurement arrangement that did not include the central tenders. Senator Ramdeen went to tongue on it. It was briefly handled by the Minister of Works, Senator Juan Sinanan. <coughs> we have pa passed procurement legislation in both houses of parliament. The procurement infrastructure is almost in place. The procurement regulator has been appointed by the president. The office of the, that has been established. I think it's in this building itself, the, the, the parliamentary building. So that legislation will be proclaimed, and the prime minister has gone on record that it will be proclaimed in the shortest possible time, hopefully before the end of this year. <clears throat> but having said that, the procurement of this vessel was never in, in breach of the Central Tenders Board. Every single administration in this country has used special purpose companies to procure. Yep. NITCO, in fact, if there was any abuse of the procurement system was under the UNC from 2010 to 2015. They know that, they know that. NITCO, you ever hear about the famous addendum 2 for the OS contract? That was a UNC creation on the NITCO. The massive hundred and billion dollar contract that was given to the EMBD. That Madam, one contractor Madam has us in court. I'm just the building up to the... Please. Yeah, I'm just... I'm just the I'll, 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 no, no, no. I will allow the minister. He is answering um, to some extent what has been raised by Senator Ramdeen, so I'm allowing him to respond. <clears throat> and I, I will close off on this point and, and, and make my final point on procurement of boots. We have set up a cabinet committee, not to buy the vessel, but to look for a vessel because the system in the Port Authority had broken down. And I think they did a good, did a good job, and I want to publicly congratulate the team that was headed by Minister Imbud, including the Minister of Public Utilities, including the then Minister of, of, of Tourism, and the Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister. <clears throat> you know what the UNC did? The then Prime Minister, the Honorable Kamala Pusad Bisesa, went to China, and she saw a boot. She never even bought the boot, and she said, I want that one. <laughs> The body boat and the boat it here, you know, it was supposed to be a gunship. It never come with a gun. <laughs> <laughs> they went to the Damon shipyard in the Netherlands and they bought seven vessels on trust. Yeah. We had to pay for it. That's procurement UNC style. Mm -hmm. We have been in office for three years and there hasn't been one incident in which it can be said that there was any corruption in the procurement system under this administration. So, we move on. Let me talk about the, the hollow balloon that everybody seems to be talking about when the vessel will reach, when the vessel will reach. It's, it's, I mean, there are so many newspaper and radio stations and television and stations in Trinidad. Everybody wants news. First and foremost, the, the vessel is not a vessel constructed for long haul. We just normally call long haul here transatlantic. If transatlantic is long haul, then what is a trans-Pacific long haul? For those of you who did geography, have a degree in geography and geology, the Pacific Ocean is by far the largest ocean on Earth. And to sail from China to Mexico via Honolulu is not an easy journey. 
especially for a boat that is not constructed as an ocean liner vessel. So it has to take its time. And every week, some reporter had to call you, when the vessel coming. I just feel sorry for Minister Sinanan, you know. Good? Because every week he has to be on his phone trying to answer when the vessel will reach. It's a new engine. It has to take its time. And when it reaches Honolulu and a little leak appears here and a little um, fuel pump or a little water pump breaks down, which are a disposable parts just to replace, it's as if a major engine defect has occurred on the boat. So, it is brand new, but it's, it's coming after a long haul. When it comes to Trinidad, do you know, do you know how many Scarborough to Port of Spain journey is equivalent to a journey from China to Trinidad? It will run for two years in Trinidad and still recover that distance. So, so it, it is just making a mountain out of a molehill. The other thing I want, to, the other aspect of this I want to bring up, because the vehicle, if you design, let me use another analogy. Nowadays, everybody buying pants off the rack. When the days when you had tailors, when you go buy a tailor, buy your pants length, measure yourself and make your pants. The pants come out to fit. But when you go and buy one of the rack, I am a short person. I buy 34 ways, but <laughs> most, most likely I will have to hem it because it's too long for me. And nowhere will I buy a, a, a pants, anywhere in the world, that it will fit me by length, it will fit me by waist, it will fit me by thing. So when you buy a, a, a vessel that was built and it wasn't built to your perfect specification, there must be a process called retrofitting. <laughs> and we are lucky that the, the retrofitting did not have to be elaborate because the vessel was designed to work between mainland Venezuela and Margarita, which is in similar operating environment to us from Scarborough to Port of Spain. What is the big fuss? Go to Cuba. Okay? People making thoughts about a canopy. <laughs> because there's a tendency to do fishing. You know what fishing is in the computer world? They're looking for things that don't exist. They're looking for corruption. But if you're looking for corruption, don't look here. <laughs> look somewhere else. I wouldn't say where. There has been absolutely no corruption in the procurement of that vessel. Sandals, all we have is a memorandum of understanding and sandals. Yes, so, so they are looking for ghosts. They are looking for needles in a haystack. And they are fishing. And they are fishing where no fish is biting. So, Madam President, I continue. And just give me two minutes of latitude again, if you so desire. <laughs> On March the 28th, 2017, the agents for the MV Superfast Galicia advised the Ministry of Works of its decision to withdraw the vessel. That started after it had an 18-month contract. That started the collapse of the sea bridge. This was compounded by the fact that there wasn't a proper maintenance program for the express and the spirit. So then we had problems with the, with the performance of the spirit and the express. The spirit went into dry docks and that had its own challenges. We procured a boat called the Ocean Flower that had its challenges when it came to Panama for the inspection. So we were forced into a position where we needed a passenger ferry quickly and as the Minister of Work said, you, you don't go to Southern Hardware, oh, um, Southern Wholesale Hardware, and say, give me a boat. That's right. 
You will get anything else in Southern Wholesale Hardware except boots. Paid commercial. I, I wouldn't want to say what you could get there. <laughs> so <clears throat> we, we instituted a procurement process for this boot. And a lot has been said in the fishing exercise to find out what went wrong, how it went wrong, what type of corruption took place. And it goes to show uh, that is the, in the psychology and the DNA of the UNC. <laughs> now, let me start with the second part of the motion. And no, no, let me continue with the second part of the motion. And whereas the Minister of Finance has advised that the government was guided in the amount it paid for the vessel by the valuation report of two independent international firms. And it goes on to say, and whereas it was discovered that one of the two terms that conducted the valuation is owned by the same company from which the government purchased the value of the vessel. There are subtle innuendos in there, you know. Because it is implying that you're using the valuation that, is a, that was conducted by a subsidiary or affiliated company of the owner of the vessel to determine the price that you pay. That was debunked by the Minister of Finance. Look, I have all the reports here. You know. I have to get cabinet approval for that and the Minister of Finance. <laughs> Good. Look at here. The Oceanic Design and Survey. So this is the company that is supposedly a, a subsidiary or an affiliated company of the, um, of the seller, which is C-Lease Limited. The total value they said is US $19 million, 17th November 2017, the report is here. But this came out with the package, as the Minister of Finance explained, of, that was submitted by the, by the, the owners of the boat. So oh, if we had taken this valuation and bought the boat for 17 million, Jesus Christ. Sorry, sorry. If we had, I don't want to be sacrilegious, I apologize. If we had taken just this valuation and purchased that boat, all hell would have broken loose in Trinidad and Tobago. So what did we do? We went to Schulte. S-C-H-U-L-T-E, and, and, and the reputation of the firm was already explained by the Minister of Finance, and got a valuation. It's a detailed valuation. It has vessel particulars, key dates, classification, certification, speed and power, fire protection and life saving, inspection summary, vessel conditions, Navigation, bridge, passenger deck, car ramps, anchor, windlass, crew accommodation, deck, navigation and communication equipment, engine spaces, you name it, everything is covered here. Pictures to back up the evaluation. They estimated just around $35 million. 35. So you have a situation here where the, the owners or the, the a company that is affiliated to the owners sees 19 million. This internationally reputable company sees 35 million. And, it, and Senator Ramdin raising a question, um, well, something wrong with this? The issue is, this is like a Lloyd's of London, you know. Okay, so we went ahead negotiated the $19 million down to $17.4 million U.S. dollars. And to you, Madam President, if $17.4 million, based on the specification of this boot, done by Schulte, is not value for money, I do not know what is. So, 
We went ahead and we purchased the vessel. The vessel started its long journey to Trinidad and Tobago, to Trinidad and Tobago. And I, am, I can guarantee you when the retrofitting that is to the account of the owner is completed in Cuba, in Santiago de Cuba, and it, it arrives in Trinidad, there, there will be some retrofitting which is to the account of the, the buyer that will be done for the boat, the, the, the boat will go into service. And once and for all, the people of Tobago, and to a lesser extent, the people of Trinidad, will be well served by a sea bridge service that will be probably second to none since we have had independence. And let me go ahead with the, move ahead with the, um, the motion. But before I, I go on to that, I just want to draw your attention, Madam President, to another what I will call fake news that was propagated by Senator Mark. Okay. Senator Mark said here on the handset that the wire transfer remember this one very clearly. The wire transfer or the check, well it wasn't a check, it was a wire transfer was made to a company called C Management Corporation Services PTY Limited. And they are the trustees for the Ballantyne Dawson Family Trust. <laughs> Why is that? Where did you get that information from, Senator Mark? <laughs> Why? <laughs> On the internet? <laughs> well, there, there's no UNC complex again, you know. I don't even know what, what is the address of the UNC. I am the chairman of the PNM and I do not even know what is the address of the UNC. And I should know that because of intelligence. Eh? They are homeless. Yes. The, 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 the seller. It was confirmed by the Minister of Finance. He's in charge of finance in the country. To get the 17.4 million as a pay, it has to come through the Ministry of Finance, the Budgets Department, the Czech staff at the Ministry of Finance. It was paid to Sealy's Limited. And who owns Sealy's? This is Sealy's <laughs> Limited. Who owns it? Good? Yeah, yeah. So do not. Uh, not on the floor. It's, it's not uh, who owns and who doesn't own, it's who the check, the check was made payable to. And we move on, Madam President. And whereas, in the interest of transparency and accountability in the procurement of the Inter-Island Ferry, several reports were made for the Minister of Finance to provide the Senate with copies of the valuation report. The memorandum of agreement between NITCO and the vendor of sale, the Dun and Bradstreet report and the Galleon passenger, and yet none of these documents was provided. Not every document that has been prepared in, within the executive, in the conduct of the affairs of the country, has to be made public. Okay? And not everything that is, is, is done, you have to make every day, otherwise there will be so much piles and piles of documents in the parliament. It, it will be un, un, unbearable. Madam President, there's absolutely nothing to hide. The reports are here, and one day, if it is so the desire of the Cabinet and the Ministry of Finance, this, this matter will be made public, but I do not have jurisdiction over that issue. So, Madam President, while it, it may seem on the surface that this motion has a lot of latitude for a debate, it really doesn't. And hence the reason I have nothing much more to say on it. 
I think I have dealt with the issue of procurement. I've dealt with the issue that we did not require central tenders board approval for the procurement process that we went through. I have justified the need for the, the ministerial committee that was appointed by the cabinet. I have shown without any reasonable doubt that there was no impropriety in the transaction of, 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 this, of this matter. I have shown, together with the Minister of Finance, that there were two audit um, valuations, one by an affiliate company of the owners, one by a third party, independent, internationally acclaimed valuator. Strange enough, but we have to accept it as fact, the, the third party independent valuator of international repute came up with a higher valuation than the, the one affiliated to the, to the owner. And then, finally, the request for these reports to be tabled in the Senate, that is a matter that is subject to the Cabinet. So I think I have debunked this motion. I think the Minister of Finance has, has done an even better job than I did initially with debunking this motion. I think the Minister of, of Transport and Works have also added his two cents in, the, in, 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 in this matter. I, I want, to, compli I want to, to compliment Senator Mahave because he was the only brave one from the independent bench to get up and say something because he's brave. And he made a valid point. And the point is that very shortly, this country would not be having these kind of tit -a tat the, the procurement legislation would be proclaimed and we would have a transparent system in Trinidad and Tobago for the procurement of public goods and services. On the opposition side, they fell flat today. Yeah. They, normal, they normally fall flat on most days, <laughs> but today the world is flatter <laughs> because of them. <laughs> Madam President, I thank you. There's a book called The World is Flat. It, 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 is, it is an IT book. But UNC has felt even flatter than that. I thank you, Madam President. Senator Haynes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. I witnessed the leader of government business fight to make up time so that he would not have to sit down here today and have someone respond to what is, has to be one of the most vacuous contributions that I have ever <laughs> you can do better than that. <laughs> Rephrase, withdraw, and come again, please. Madam President, the, I withdraw. Yeah, I, I withdraw, All right? But Madam President, the motion asked for a simple thing. The motion asks for certain reports to be laid before the Senate. The minister, the leader of government business, the minister of works, and the minister of finance all came here today and quoted liberally from the reports, right? And they're asking us, Madam President, to trust them and to trust that what they are telling us is in a report is indeed fact. But Madam President, the whole reason we had to bring this private member's motion is for the simple fact that we cannot trust them. We cannot trust them, and we in particular cannot trust them on this issue. Because Madam President, if you trace this Seabridge fiasco from its inception, what Trinidad and Tobago has been faced with is one fiction after another as it rolls out, which has in, which in the most I think dubious fiction story that we have ever witnessed in this country. Madam President, I, the, again, Senator Ramdi noted from early on in his contribution, the Minister of Finance came here to say, this is a waste of time, and we are wasting people's time. And then they all proceeded to treat this matter as a joke. But the country is not laughing, Madam President. No one is laughing but them. This fake news argument, 
the entire defense of the government, which could have simply been laid to rest by bringing the documents before us. Instead, they stood here to tell us about fake news. Yeah. Let me tell you about this fake news narrative, right? Most people who bring it to the forefront who claim everything is fake news are usually the persons propagating the fake news. If you follow it, if you follow what fake news has done to the political landscape, those persons who seek to deflect, who seek to be not held accountable, who seek to deny the people of their country transparency in executive affairs, stand up and tell everybody else they are pre presenting fake news. And that is what we saw here today, Madam President. And if, yes, it is a Trumpian politics that I have, that I really never expected to witness in our, in, in our, in our, in our parliament, Madam President. As a matter of fact, as we spoke about fake news, I had to quickly, you know, the, the, the government sought to, sought to tell us that they have been nothing but transparent with this Galleon's passage, um, this Galleon's passage debacle. And when I went through Minister Imbert's Twitter, right, which was, by the way, the main source of information on the Galleon's passage that we had, right? It was, it was the Twitter account of the Minister of Finance, right? And again, I don't want to draw any parallels, but I think the country is well informed enough on international affairs to know where I'm going with this, right? And the last, the last tweet, Madam President, on the Galleon's passage was on the, third of, uh, was on the 4th of March, 2018. And since then, even the Minister of Finance knew better than to bring this up in the public domain because they had no clue when this boat was going to get here. They had no clue on where we were going next. And Madam President, so they came here with a weak defense and sort of say that the motion fell flat when all they needed to do was present the evidence. Because if the evidence would vindicate you, if the evidence would vindicate you, then the simplest thing to do would have been to agree with the motion. Yes, 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 exactly. But they did none of that, exactly. Madam President. Exactly. They did none exactly. of that. Exactly. And so as I said, Madam President, the motion asks very clearly, in the interest of transparency and accountability, a platform, Madam President, that this sitting government campaigned on, that they seem very reluctant to fulfill, extremely reluctant to fulfill on any regard, that they would lay copies of the valuation reports, the memora memorandum of agreement between Nidco and the vendor, and the Dun and ba Bradstreet report on the Galleon's passage. Simple enough, Madam President, easy going. Instead, we came here on a, on a merry-go-round, of, of, of fake news. And, and Madam President, this kind of, of appeal to, uh, to the population to say anybody that is asking for accountability does not have your interest at heart, Madam President, has to be ludicrous. Uh. Has to be ludicrous. Right? To come here and say that not everything, not every paper presented before the executive is meant for public consumption that there'll be an avalanche of paper. We don't mind reading, Madam President. Reading is not a difficulty for any of us. Bring the papers on, we will read them, and we can ascertain the validity of the documents. We have no problem with doing that work, Madam President. But instead, to be told, just trust the government. There, there, it will be all right. Madam President, I refuse to accept that here today. I thought we were coming here Madam President, for the government to mount a very serious defense on a very serious matter. Instead, because they were incapable of doing that, incapable of defending the indefensible, they decided to treat it as a joke, which in itself is a deflection on a poor one at that. So Madam President, I hope as we prepare to end our private members day, that the government takes an op opportunity to reflect on the fact that they are mandated to be accountable to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah, that is not a choice that you have. We do not live in a country where you decide what you want to tell us. You tell us what you have done with our taxpayers' dollars. There, there's no option in that, Madam President. We are servants of the people. We are here to serve, and you must answer the questions brought before you in this house. 
Madam President. And so I find it, again, to be, to be alarming, the, the, the defense that the, the government mount. The, min the leader of government business came here to minimize the issues found in this new vessel. Talking about a little leak and a little... <clears throat> Madam President, I beg to move that the Senate do not adjourn to tomorrow, that's Wednesday the 27th of June, at 1.30 p.m. During that sitting, we'll be taking through all its stages, the Corporation Tax Amendment Bill, and time permitting, we will... Um, commence debate on the electronic payments in the court um, bill that is on the um, order paper also. It is only because we are nearing the end of the sitting that I will not take action on that last issue. Honorable Senators, before I put the question on the adjournment, leave has been granted for two matters to be raised. Senator Mark. Thank you very much. Madam President, thank you very much. I rise to address a very burning question or matter facing Trinidad and Tobago. And that has to do, Madam President, with the, the rise and the escalation in crime and criminality in Trinidad and Tobago and the need for the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago to give consideration to a proposal that the leader of the opposition, the Honorable Kamala Prasad Bissasa, former Prime Minister of our Republic, had suggested. Madam President, there's no doubt that the crime tsunami has overwhelmed the police service to some extent, and there is need for help for the police service. And Madam President, this is manifested by the government listening and sometimes taking action to employ joint police and army patrols throughout hotspot or hotspot areas of our country. The Joint Police Army patrols, which have been going on for several years, as you know, Madam President, do not provide the soldiers with the avenue to institute action against persons who might be engaged in unlawful activities or who are breaking the law. And we believe that the time has come, given the fear that has injected the society, the growing threat to citizens' safety and security, for the government to consider, Madam President, looking once again at even if, Madam President, it is on a temporary basis. Even if you have to bring legislation and we have to invoke and establish a sunset clause, but in the interest of stability, in the interest of national security, in the interest of public safety, it is important, imperative, and critical that the government of Trinidad and Tobago look very critically and strategically at the whole issue, Madam President, of providing our soldiers with temporary powers of arrest. The Honorable Leader of the Opposition has made it very clear on several occasions that because of the crime tsunami in our country and because of the need for us to put lives, people's lives, at the top of our agenda as a nation, we must do everything, Madam President, in our power 
to save lives. To save lives in our country. Madam President, you would know that the rate at which we are going, if something isn't done in a very radical way, if we do not take innovative approaches to our safety and security issues in Trinidad and Tobago, we may well end up, Madam President, with a crime statistic of over 550 murders in 2018. And Madam President, we as a parliament must do everything, everything rather, in our power to save lives. And if we have 5,000 members of the Defense Force, soldiers, members of the Coast Guard, members of the Reserve um, Reservists, and they are available, Madam President, to engage in joint police and army patrol, why not provide the legislative mechanism to assist law enforcement, to assist the police, in dealing with the kind of criminal elements that we now have in our society running roughshod, roughshod and rampant in our society. So I have brought this motion to the parliament today to deal with the matter and to address the issue of rising criminality, growing fear Madam President, Madam President, there are many areas of this country where after six, the society, the city, the area, the community shuts down. People are afraid to come out of their homes after six o'clock. I am in the Belmont community, and this is what the people are saying there as well. Whereas, Madam President, in years gone by, people could have come out six, seven, eight, and nine in the night to lime. Today, yes, my family, my, my aunt. Yeah. So, Madam President, Madam President, I, I, I am saying to the Honorable uh, Minister, Leader of Government Business, that the time has come when it comes to the issue of crime you and I know crime has no complexion. Bandits and so on do not distinguish, distinguish between PNM or UNC or COP or PP. It doesn't matter who, Madam President. When they come, Madam President, they are almost without feelings in the way that they deal with human beings in our society. And therefore, I believe that it is important for heads to be brought together to deal with this crime crisis that we have in our nation. And whilst I know that some people might be a bit reluctant, there may be reservations, Madam President, about giving the army or the regiment, as it is called, and the Coast Guard personnel, power of arrest. We are saying that we can do so, but put it on a temporary basis. If you bring legislation, put a sunset clause so it will be done for a period of time so that the people of this country can exhale. They can breathe easily, Madam President, are the more easily than they are breathing today. Senator Mark, you have one more minute. So this is why, Madam President, we have brought this matter for the attention of the parliament and the government to get a perspective from the government as to whether this proposal, this suggestion, is one that they are willing to embark upon, um, take on board, and the leader of the opposition along with the Prime Minister can meet and treat with that true legislative proposal or measure. I thank you, Madam President. Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. 
Madam President, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to respond to this motion. Madam President, I am on record as expressing concern, like many of us in here, about the issue of crime, and nothing I see should make it look as though I am not interested in fighting crime, or I'm not concerned about what is happening out there. But Madam President, I was very surprised that my colleague, Senator Mark, because I reflected on 2016 when the government brought what I thought was important, far-reaching anti-crime legislation, which was the legislation to extend the life of the, the law that dealt with gangs and the denial of bail to certain categories of persons. And the opposition, that was their own legislation that received our support when we were in opposition. And the opposition steadfastly refused to support the legislation. And to deal with that, the government returned with legislation that was focused on anti-gang provisions only. And we did not extend, or we were not able to extend the restrictions on bail. And I'm very surprised because across the country, particularly the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, had expressed the view that those restrictions on bail were helpful in keeping hardened criminals off the streets. So that is something that had worked, that was supported by law enforcement, and it did not get the support of the opposition. And now Senator Mark is asking us to bring to Parliament something that has failed and uh, I'm surprised that he's not offered in support of his motion a single measure of support for it outside the leader of the opposition. I do not know that the leader of the opposition is involved in crime fighting and law enforcement. I was expecting to hear that the police commissioner or somebody else or the data or committee report had advocated. And I got nothing of, of of that from Senator Mark, and I'm not surprised. On the 1st of March 2013, a bill was brought to Parliament, laid in the House, number 4 of 2013, an act to amend the Defense Act, Chapter 1401. Madam President, yesterday in the other place and today we introduced a bill, what we call the NIF bill, which is just two clauses. Well, this bill was just two clauses. And there were more speakers on the bill than words in the bill. <laughs> when the bill was laid in the House, there were 24 speakers stretching over four sessions. The bill was passed. And when the bill made it to the Senate, there were 18 speakers over four sessions. And this bill, with fewer words than speakers, died, failing to attract the support in this house for a number of reasons. And funny enough, Mr. Senator Mark is now asking us for a sunset clause. Well, that would have been a few more words in this bill, because that wasn't in this bill. So this has been tried, bringing it to Parliament. There's no support for it. And there are a number of reasons, dealing, ranging from constitutional to the absence of data. And the strength of it in, when it was brought was reliance on the Jamaican experience. And it didn't take us long at that time in opposition to use a word that has been used today a lot, to debunk the idea that the Jamaican model was likely to work. Madam President, also in 2013, the my friends on the other side, as part of a joint select committee appointed to inquire into and report on government ministries and so on, and they examined the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. 
And on that committee, there were seven government representatives, two independents and three opposition senators. Small may remember his, his stint on that committee. And Madam President, that committee examined during the month of May 2013, Trinidad and Tobago Police Service and rendered a, a voluminous report. And among the recommendations, the committee was set up to look into nine aspects of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service and identified eight strategies for improving the performance of the police service. And Madam President, nowhere in that report and nowhere in the consideration was there anything about giving the Defense Force powers of arrest. That, that didn't arise. So in 2013, the bill failed and their own, their committee on which they had the majority could not elicit from anybody in Trinidad and Tobago on a discussion of the work of the police service, the need to provide additional support through powers of arrest to members of the Defense Force. What the report did in fact say, and what this government acted upon, was the issue of the manpower strength of the police service. Because nobody could say what is the strength required. And the report identified, apart from overall, and one piece of data struck me back then when I read the report in 2013, was a category called not available. There were 612 persons out of 6,285 officers, 612 were simply not available due to extended sick leave, suspension, study leave, or vacation leave. And when you got into the details, you saw that in some of the key areas of the police service, homicide, for example, there was a deficiency of 90%. In other words, there were only 10% of the officers who were required. And this pointed to a significant issue of the manning of the police service, the people who have the powers of arrest, the absence of bodies, the absence of bodies in the places where you want them. And out of that, the government commissioned a manpower audit of the police service, which has generated, I believe it is 82 or 89 recommendations, none of which involve giving the members of the Defense Force the power of arrest. So, Madam President, in response to the motion, I say that it's, it's a myth. It's not supported. Even the mover of the motion has not been able to anchor his motion on anything beyond the leader of the opposition. When the debate in the two houses, a, a major factor in that debate is that, again, there was nothing which says, so said clearly and in a credible way that power of arrest to the Defense Force members would improve policing in any way. And the government believes that the focus, our most important law enforcement tool out there, is the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, over, we, over which we have some measure of, of support through resources and over which we have sometimes no control. But the point is that the persons who have the power of arrest right now are not using it sufficiently. And the idea is to get them through the commissioner of police and those charged with overseeing the police service to do more in the fight against crime. And we do not believe that the time has come for members of the Defense Force to be given powers of arrest. I thank you. Madam President, the second motion deals, the second matter rather, on the motion deals with the failure of the government to address the issue of outstanding pension payments to retirees of the Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam President, there are several citizens who have retired from the port several years now and they are paid their pensions either on a monthly basis, some of them on a fortnightly basis, but they are paid, they are retirees of the port. 
Madam President, the last number I have could be in the vicinity of 493. It could be a little less, but that's the last number I have. Their pension, and there are three pension plans at this Port Authority, and all were supposed to be administered by Colonial Life Insurance Company Limited, Clico. There was, Madam President, an agreement to pay these retirees increased pensions as well as COLA. I think the last time they experienced an increase in pension and COLA was in 2015. And since then to now, they have been struggling. Many of them have died seeking to have their pension increased as well as the enjoyment of COLA. Some pensioners on the port enjoy COLA payments. Some of them have increased their pensions, whilst others have not been able to enjoy any increases in their pensions and in their COLA. Madam President, this matter was taken up sometime in 2017. That is outstanding pension payments and cost of living allowances. And the Port Authority did advise in writing that these matters were currently engaging the attention of the board and management. That was since August of 2017. But the port, even though we know they are faced with a number of challenges, financial challenges, they did give an undertaking that they are committed to having a speedy, a speedy resolution to these outstanding issues, namely outstanding pension payments and cost of living allowances. But Madam President, it is almost approaching one year from that date, and no action has been taken to address these outstanding pension and cost of living allowances payments to these retirees. My information is that CLECO, which administers the pension plan, there remains an outstanding amount of monies owed to the CLECO pension plan on behalf of these port workers. The information I have is that it crosses over $40 million that the plan is short by. So there's a deficit. So the Port Authority is owing, according to information reaching me, the CLECO pension plan or the CLECO based on these three pension plans, some $40 million and above. Madam President, I think that the time has come for the Minister of Works and Transport to honor the increased payments for the Port Authority retirees. As I said, many of them are passing on. They are dying every day or every year, and therefore they are not enjoying the benefits that they are entitled to. And I want to refer the minister to the Port Authority Act, Chapter 5101, Sections 24, 25, 26 of this Act, and it is Part 
three that deals with financial provisions. So if it is, Madam President, the Port Authority does not have the funding to underwrite these pension plans by providing CLECO with the relevant outstanding monies that are owed to CLECO, then the government can, in fact, go to the Port Authority Act. And under Section 24 of that Act, for the purposes of meeting their obligations to pensioners, as an example, the government can, in fact, with the support of the cabinet, secure a loan in order to meet these payments to these pensioners. Madam President, you know pension is an entitlement. It is a right that citizens enjoy. <coughs> and it is very, very sad when I meet these elderly citizens who have retired from the port and who can hardly walk and they are appealing for assistance. They are appealing for help. And no one is hearing them. No one is listening to them. No one is coming to their aid. Well, this evening I have decided to come to their aid. I am speaking on behalf of the Port Authority retirees. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking the government the Minister of Works and Transport and the Minister of Finance to honor their obligations to these retirees of the Port Authority. They are entitled to increase pensions in accordance with their agreements. They are entitled to increase cost of living allowances in accordance with these agreements. Honor those outstanding agreements and outstanding pensions and cost of living allowances for these retirees. And Madam President, I would like to appeal to the Minister of Works and Transport, because we have spoken about this matter, to take the necessary steps and measures to fulfill this obligation. You have under a minute. Sir. Yes, Madam President. I'm appealing to the Honorable Minister of Works and Transport to do what is right do what is necessary to ensure that we honor the obligations of these persons and make sure that their pensions and cost of living allowances are honored and satisfied. I thank you very much, Madam President. Minister of Works and Transport. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, again, let me from the onset dispel the perception being insinuated in this motion, that the government is in debt in the form of outstanding pension payment to retirees of the Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam President, there is no such debt on the books of the Port Authority, and it is very unfortunate that this motion is crafted in a way to give this meaningless impression. Madam President, I am advised that the Seamen and Waterfront Workers Union is the official representative body for all current and retired general staff of the Port Authority. However, a body now known as the Port Retiree Pension Committee has evolved as a group which is now considered the official lobby for the number of retirees who have pension-related grievances. I am also aware, Madam President, that one Wayne J. Mark wrote, Wayne. former chairman of the Port Authority, by letter dated July 28, 2017, in his capacity as a representative of the Port Retiree, calling for an expeditious conclusion to the outstanding issues within the shortest possible time. Madam President, I don't know, but I assume that given the personal interest in this matter, Senator Mark, if he is that person named in the letter as the author, 
should have declared his personal interest in this matter before piloting the motion. The matter, the matter engaged the Senate is to address the business of people of Trinidad and Tobago and not to further one's private interests. But I will leave that for another discussion. And Senate Minister, I, I, I don't, I think you should restate whatever you have to say or move on, please. Madam President, in summary, this group is lobbying for an increase in pension payment by $200 and $350 monthly for 493 port retired pension effective January 1st, 2013 at a cost of approximately $12 million. Even though this matter predates this present PNM government, the records will show that the previous UNC government did not address the issue when it was first raised since 2013. I have in my possession a draft cabinet note dated 5th of June 2015 under former Minister of Transport and the previous UNC minister did not see it necessary to advance this note further. Madam President, as mentioned earlier, the Port Retiree Pension Committee is clamoring for monthly increases in their pension payment in accordance with the rules of the pension plan. I am advised that the rule states as follow. If a report by Acuary shows a surplus beyond the requirements for the fund, such surplus or any part thereof may with the consent of the employer and on the written advice of the Acuary either be set aside as a special reserve against future contingencies or be employed in increasing the pension and or prospective pensioners of members of the fund by employing a reduced in the, in the contribution of the employees and or contributing members. Madam President, I was advised that the pension committee was informed previously by a report from the Acuary that two of the port pension plans, namely the port contractor's monthly paid plan and the port authority weekly daily paid plan were in deficit and one port contractor's weekly and daily paid plan was in surplus. The approximate cost to providing a pension increase of $200 and $300 per month effective from January 1st, 2013 is an additional liability of approximately $3.7 million to $8.8 .8 million, in addition to a back pay of $2.4 million. The Port Authority has previously indicated to the Pension Committee that it is not in a financial position to finance the pension increase under the terms of the pension plan and cannot commit to an annual increase in liability with regards to the pension plan. Madam President, under this government and under the PNM appointed Board of the Commissioners, I am advised that the Port Authority is making all efforts to settle all outstanding employee contribution to its pension fund while outstanding employee contributions have been brought up to date. These were due and owing since 2014. Despite the fact that this matter issue, issue of pension payment increases has been engaged in the authority since 2013 under the UNC government, nothing was done to settle this matter by the UNC. I am happy to report to the national committee that I have been advised that this matter will be on the agenda for discussion and resolution at the next meeting of the Board of Commissioners of the Port Authority. Madam President, it is very important to remind the Senate that the last increase in pension payment was made under a PNM government in 2006. This payment was in the form of an ex gratia payment at a total cost of $28,673,967. Madam President, Nothing happened under the UNC government on this matter. The, this PNM government is once again decisively addressing the requests of the port retirees. We are committed to, se to settling all issues regarding outstanding payments to the pensioners for pension fund, which occurred under the UNC, and we are now about to address the issue being raised by these retirees. We have managed to do this and more in just under three years. The government, and we, and we commit to address all other issues of the port retirees in an expeditious manner and in keeping with our 
existing financial circumstances. As we have constantly done, whenever the PNM is in government, Madam President, very soon, once the board of the port arrives at a position on this issue, the matter will be taken to cabinet and a decision will be made in the best interest of the retirees and the nationals of, of Trinidad and Tobago. This motion is therefore skewed and out of order because the record will show that this matter is finally receiving full attention of the port authorities under this PNM government. I thank you. Honorable Senators, the question is that this Senate do Honorable Senators, the question is that this Senate do now adjourn to Wednesday, June the 27th, 2018, at 1.30 p.m. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those again say no. The ayes have it. The Senate now stands adjourned to Wednesday, the 27th of June, 2018, at 1.30 p.m.